Hello and welcome to Youngstown Playlist, a show dedicated to highlighting local musicians right here in Youngstown, Ohio. Some people make music as a hobby and some people make it their lifestyle. Today we're talking to somebody who lives to make music. Here is Hayden Brook. Today I'll be what you made me Clueless about yes, no's and maybes That isn't leaving us Baby, I know you think I'm crazy I am Smile makes these feelings bubble It's what I call impending doom You live a man who shouldn't be troubled But I'm still jerking off in my You know, why did you get into music? What brought you to where we are today? <sighs> Music's the only thing I'd ever see myself doing for the rest of my life, to be honest. Really? I've tried a lot of different venues in my life. I've tried working at a steel mill. I've worked at McDonald's for like the first, well, I was like 15 to 19 I worked there. Um, but no, it's always been the biggest part of my life. It's always been my driving force as to, honestly, what keeps me happy and what keeps me sane is the best way to put it. <laughs> so, being sane without music, key. I might yeah. lose my mind. <laughs> <laughs> what it, is it about the songwriting process or performing that keeps you sane? Like, is, is there any way to articulate oh, that? Yes, of course there is. Uh, just, just the vulnerability and the openness, the fact that we're able to write these lyrics and piece all these songs together and have a very um, cohesive piece that represents how I'm feeling at whatever time the song is written or whatever the song is supposed to represent. Um, it's just such a good way to capture what happens in the moment and just truly represent myself. And a, a lot of times with keeping me sane, it comes from the fact that there's some things that I have a hard time getting out to the open. There's a, hard, a lot of things that I have a hard time saying to others. And uh, sometimes it just comes easier through the music. It's a lot easier to write it down and play it out than it is to sit down and talk to somebody about it. It's almost therapeutic in a sense, sure. you know? Yeah, you find that a lot.
And that's one of my favorite things about it. And it draws everybody closer together. Like I wouldn't have all these friends with me and all these people here if it probably wasn't for music. Um, I mean, maybe, but <laughs> it's definitely a, a helping point. Sure. It, it really is. Honestly, I didn't really start doing some serious, serious songwriting until after I got like through my first two years of college. And that's when I actually started taking it very seriously and actually started diving in and taking the time to really develop these songs to truly represent who I am. Um, I was always into heavier music, to be honest, growing up. Um, but just something about, uh, again, the openness and the vulnerability of folk music just really gripped me like around the age of maybe 22, 23. And that's when me and him started getting together and practicing and rehearsing. And, and if I could interject, before we did what we're doing now, we played very loud, heavy, yes, we did. awesome, angry We started music. in a hardcore <laughs> band. Awesome. That's how we started, yeah. actually. Well, me and Pat, at least. I yeah. heard those recordings. They were quite good. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, they were actually good. They're pretty good. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Those actually may be released here very soon. That would be awesome. So we just got the masters back. That, right? So, okay. huh? can have a second episode for that. Exactly. <laughs> With, if you want to. Yeah. yeah. Come back a completely different genre. Yeah. I'll just wear a face mask at that point. <laughs> we'll be like the Youngstown Slipknot, you know. <laughs> I, I yeah. loved Slipknot. <laughs> I really did. Oh, man. And people thought those masks were gimmicky, but honestly, I thought that's what made the band. I did own a Slipknot CD, too. I, I will not, I can't hide that from my past, you know. It was going to come out sooner or later. It haunts, me every, well. I mean, it haunts me every night. We did the duo thing for a long time. Um, a long time. About three and we years. We still occasionally do. Um, but, you know, it, there reaches a point, I think, when you want to do more. You know, when you want, like, low end or you want someone to fill some, some riffs or someone to do extra harmonies or whatever it is. Um, and we've had a pretty good rotating cast of people in and out <laughs> yeah. of in the last couple of years, I would say. So... Um, but I think we have a pretty cool lineup. Yeah, pretty cool. <laughs> I think we're pretty cool. <laughs> I'd say it's pretty much finalized at this point. Yeah. So. So what have you found to be the hardest part of pursuing this music career? We'll kind of break it up. What's the hardest music part? And then what's the hardest part in like getting out there, the performance end of it? Um, the hardest part musically is just, trying to voice what I want to do and trying to communicate with that with them and have them actually answer and play what I'm trying to think in my head. Because you know, you've got all these ideas, but to actually sit there and put these ideas out on paper and actually have them reciprocate properly, it's, yeah. it's, it's difficult, you know? And I don't know. At this point, if they get close enough, I, I usually enjoy it because they're doing their own thing as well and that brings something new to the table and that brings a different element to the song, like an element that I didn't even know was possible. And that may actually help the song grow to become better than what I had imagined. Yeah. Now, overall, I think the hardest thing with uh, playing music is just getting everybody together, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be the biggest issue. That's, that's trying to take to five different show. people and trying to like schedule everything properly and actually get everybody together on one day out of the week, especially when we're all so busy. We all play in different bands. Um, we're all very in view to the music scene. Um, so just finding that availability is kind of the hardest part of this yeah. point. Talk about just the sound in general that you want your shows or your music to have. Oh, um, as good as it possibly can be. Yeah. We can just leave it there. We'll just leave it yeah. there. <laughs> That's I what I want. I want it to sound yeah. as good as it can. We're going, like, going, for, elements. We're going for a um, mediocre sound. That's kind of okay. our shtick, you know? Okay. But no, I, I love the layers. <laughs> I love having... Too, it, sounded, it sounded too good. I think you might... You still got work to do. <laughs> If only. <laughs> um, but no, I love the layers. Um, but the more you add layers, the more you have to worry about um, the brilliance or the clarity of each instrument. You know, sure. you want everybody to be present, but you don't want somebody else to overpower somebody. You don't want it to sound muddy. Mm -hmm. You still want that clarity, and you want everybody's voice to be heard because every part is important. You know, those layers are there for a reason. It's supposed to help the song grow and really give it some character. With the EP, though, we had a lot of fun with that one. I think yeah. with, um, with my buddy Adam Shuntich, who plays with Joshua Powell and the Great Train Robbery, they're an Indiana-based band. Uh, they're actually like a nationally touring act. They're pretty cool. Um, but he ended up laying down, what was it, 12 guitar tracks yeah. for the EP for like each song? I mean, it was all in stereo, yeah. so technically it was six tracks, but you know, left and right ended up being 12. Um, but we ended up cutting it down to three. But yeah, I don't know, still. Yeah. It, it's and just, it took us, what, a year and a half to finalize Three songs. songs. <laughs> <laughs> we were dragging our feet a little bit, but um, and we're a bit of perfectionist too. Sure. So yeah, yeah that'll catch you up. Yeah. I'm not going to put out anything I'm not happy with. So, I've had interviews with other people who kind of 
acknowledge that themselves. I mean, obviously, it's your work. Your name's attached to it. You want it to be the best. But I mean, what? Taking a step back, what do you? What are your thoughts about having that? Um, pros and cons of being in that mentality. Um, the pros are obviously you get a better product at the end. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, I think there's more cons than there are pros, though, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, I, I, <laughs> the I cons are it like takes that. more time. It takes a hell of a lot more time. Yeah. Um, and you end up pissing people off, too, because you, know, you want them to do something that you're trying to get them to understand, but it never really comes across clearly. It, it just doesn't. In the end, it almost always works out. Um, what, what are some cons to that, Pat? Um, cons being that you want, so like I think um, looking at like Sp how Spotify works now where you have bands that aren't really releasing, um, you have people that are releasing albums sure, but you have bands that are releasing like demos now. Yeah. So like there are bands or singles on Spotify. And that's cool, but like I kind of like having when you have like a cool cohesive album, I'm just going to kind of stare at you guys as I talk. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> When you have like a cool cohesive album yep. and it sort of makes more sense, you know, yeah, versus sure. like, yeah. you know, throwing singles out to people and it's like the, the age of like everything at your fingertips, you know. And, sure. Um, but, you know, if you take your time, you don't really get stuff out there to people. So, you know, should it take you a year and a half to do three songs? Probably not. But, you know, should we probably have done two albums in that time? Probably. <laughs> but do I have any regrets about what was released? No. I don't. Yeah, I'm happy with the product and mm -hmm. I think that's ultimately what matters. Sure. You know? Yeah. Something um, I can look back on and not regret or have anything like, ah, I wish I would have changed that. I wish I would have yeah. changed that. Like, I, did, I, I love the EP we put out. I really do. I think it captures us pretty perfectly. A lot of the conversation lately has been people just releasing, like, four or five songs as opposed to the album. So since you just mentioned, like, you want to have that cohesive work, mm -hmm. what do you think about that trend that's been, like, really just within the last couple months, maybe the last year, it's like you see a lot more shorter Yeah, albums. and I think that has to do with our generation, to be honest. We live in a very fast-paced community nowadays, you know, mm -hmm. especially with all the smartphones and the massive amount of technology and the growth there. Everything is fast-paced. Nobody really wants to sit down and spend 50 minutes listening to an entire album. No, they want 20 to 30 minutes so they can sit down, knock out, and, you know, be done with. Yeah. Like, I mean, I've, I've tried to sit people down and have them listen to my songs. Most of them pay attention, but every now and then you run into somebody who, like, tries to hold a conversation, like, third song in. It's like, yeah. I'm, I'm still trying to show you something. <laughs> like, is your attention span really that short? Yeah. Like, come on. <laughs> That's actually surprising. It'd be different if it was just, like, a recorded album. If you're right there, I got this song for you, and then they just start checking something out. Or, yeah, yeah then that's, that's rude. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. But, hey, I get it, you know. They just don't realize that you have like a blunt object in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> that and like they, they have something else going on in their life too. You know, something yeah. that takes precedence, takes priority. It, it happens. Yeah. I get it. So, there's some pros to that whole approach though too. Like, I mean, I've, I've played with different groups um, that are part of the songwriting process and not. And I think one of the good things, especially tying back into what you guys are saying about perfectionism, um, you know, if you have 10 songs that are recorded and more or less ready to put out, but you only really like six of them, you know? Most people, you know, put out these long albums where it's like you take the good with the bad, but mm -hmm. if you really only focus on the ones that you think are the best of what they could be and put you out less songs, that. I mean, that's, wouldn't that, isn't that better in the long run? I agree. Yeah, I agree. Sure. Because, like, sometimes, like, even albums I love, like, somewhere in the middle, they'll start, they'll start to fall short, yeah. you know? It's like, all right, you guys started great and you ended great, but somewhere in the middle, you guys kind of lost me. That's our show. I want to thank Hayden Brook and his band for coming and talking to us and playing for us. A huge shout out to Noble Creature Cask House for letting us shoot an episode there, and thank you for watching. Be sure to like our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel so you never miss another episode. See you next time. Do you think that's what makes a show good? Like, not so much how the performance went, but just the environment, the experience. The performance is a big part of it, but I think the environment it's also a large factor. I, I think the performance matters the most, obviously. You know, it, it could matter where you're at. If you play a bad show, you play a bad show. You're gonna feel it afterwards. You could be like in Antarctica playing something. It doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Those penguins are like, man. <laughs> I wore my best tuxedo for this. <laughs> that was good. Hey, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I'm, I'm surprised myself.